I actually have a doctorate in zoology and uh, specializing in evolutionary ecology. So I haven't done that work on that field for a whole long time. But it is something where there's a lot of stuff going on with that, and people are really looking at things differently from the way they did when I was in graduate school. They were starting to look at it this way when I was there. But you know, back then, people didn't realize, uh, you, know, you, you tried to, the, the whole thing with science was you don't want to anthropomorphize animals. You don't want to turn these animals into like they're little humans. You want to be really scientific and cold and hard about that. And in doing that, you, you really lose the ability to see a whole lot of what's going on because you reduce things down to just really mechanical things. And now, as people are starting to look at things, and we have um, people like Jane Goodall doing her you know, groundbreaking research, you know, many years ago she's done this, but you know, finding out what animals are like and then finding you know, just amazing things in terms of communication or interactions of animals. Uh, so anyway, I was excited to, to get back into this because we, we just, as humans, we always put ourselves at the top. We think we're at the top of the evolutionary scale. Everything's leading up to humans. And you look at any sort of chart, you'll see we're always at the top of this. Well, we used to think we were at the middle of the, you know, that we were at the center of the universe, too, that all the planets revolved around the Earth. And, you know, the things have been, and, you know, things have always been changing that way, but we always tend to put ourselves up at the top. And when you stop and try and look at it more objectively, you know, you realize that you're missing a whole lot of things out there. If you look at, and you don't take human values as necessarily being the best values, but you find other types of intelligence that are out there, senses that we don't have. And so anyway, I want to give an idea then. That's why I decided to do a, put together a talk on animal, animal consciousness. I do a very short version of this for the Master Vegetarian program, but I decided to expand it a lot. So let me just uh, start out here by giving a few credits, I'm going to borrow heavily from this in this talk from two sources. One is a book which is not yet out. I'm holding it in my hands, but it's not yet out. Uh, it'll be out in March by Jonathan Balcom called Second Nature, The Inner Lives of Animals. Uh, he, they sent me a copy of this because I asked them to because I knew there was going to be a lot of stuff because I know Jonathan Balcom is really good. The other one, which has been out for many years actually, is an excellent series that you can probably check out from your local library. Uh, it's from the Nature series called Animal Minds, and it's actually a three-part series. It's equivalent of three full hour-long television programs looking at animal intelligence, animal emotions, and animal consciousness. And there's a lot of things in here which are troubling. There are a lot of things that I kind of disagree with. But overall, w looking at this thing, you just see amazing things in there about how animals behave. Well, what is consciousness? <laughs> And I loved the old Star Trek with Data because they explored this issue so many times, especially in the early years, as what is consciousness and what isn't. And I can remember you know, where one time it was like a, a law trial where they're trying to determine whether Data was really sentient or not. And this one person went up and flicked the switch, turning them off. And you know, is that sentient if you can do that? And then you make the analogy, well, what if you go to sleep? Isn't that kind of the same? So anyway, but the, what is being conscious? And, I tend to go to the simplest things, the, you know, the sort of definition you find in a dictionary of knowing or feeling, being able to feel and think, being awake. But you know, what is it that makes us consciousness? And the other thing is, how do you prove conscious, that other things are conscious? How do I know that you're conscious? How do you know that I'm conscious? You know, I could just be a computer up here you know, doing things, or I could be a figment of your imagination for all you know. You know we all probably have had thoughts like this. But we've all kind of accepted that the other humans are conscious, but we have, a lot of us have put a real trouble um, looking at other animals and coming up with the same conclusion. Um, and what you often see is people then throw up their hands saying, well, there's no way to prove something's conscious. And to me, that's a, that's a cop out because you can't prove anything in science really. You can just pr produce a whole bunch of evidence and there are testable hypotheses you can use to figure out whether something's conscious or not. You know, you can make a hypothesis that if it's conscious, it will do this. If it's not conscious, you know, something else will happen. And we're going to be talking about that throughout here. So, here. but if you want to go back to some past stuff, and I get this out of one of Ramona Ilya's talks, uh, where we came from, Rene Descartes this car, uh, was a brilliant mathematician. Um, and he was a brilliant philosopher in one sense. He's the one who was responsible for the I think, therefore I am. But boy, on animal issues, looking at it from the lens of I look at it, he was horrid. Um, because he believed, 
and he truly believed this, that animals were just machines. That an animal was no more alive and conscious than this computer is. And so although you wouldn't have any second thoughts of going to the computer and making adjustments to it without using anesthesia first, uh, he thought that way of animals. He'd do the sections on live animals. Uh, so, you know, just horrid stuff. And, and, but he was very influential. And to, even to today, there are people who have these sorts of thoughts, probably leading all the way back to, to him. Well, more recently, where the whole genesis of my doing this first talk that I did at the Master Vegetarian Program was I was in the car driving somewhere with my wife and we heard, I forget which one of those shows it was, but on PBS uh, radio, they have uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and What Do You Know, both, both in the morning. I forget which one it was, but they often have these questions that they ask their guest panelists and, and you have to guess the right answer. And one of them was, do fish feel pain? And the right answer they gave was no. And I was stunned. I just couldn't believe that anybody would not believe that fish feel pain. So I went back and hopped on the internet and looked around. And what I found was Dr. James Rose, who is a, um, uh, I think he's a University of Wyoming uh, professor, actually is published on this. And this is his reasoning. When you read it, it actually seems to make a whole lot of sense right off. His argument is, let's look at how you perceive pain. And look at a human brain there, and then in co contrast, look at a trout brain, a fish brain. That's how big the trout brain is relative to the human. If you expand it out, this is what the trout brain looks like if you expand it out to look at it. But the, the, um, what their argument is that humans possess this big cerebrum with this neocortex. The neocortex is the outer layer of the cerebrum. And that's where we do a lot of our conscious thinking. Fish brains, in contrast, are, they respond to stimuli down to the lower brain. This is their cerebrum. It's just that little black dot there. That's the equivalent of their cerebrum. So he says fish have this really tiny cerebrum and they don't have a neocortex. So therefore, even though they might have nerves where they can sense, you know, where there are pain nerves, they bring, stuff into, they bring it up to the lower brain and he thinks that they're not really conscious of pain. Well, that sounds logical in a sense, but that didn't, didn't get me at all. Because I thought, well, what if you just looked at sight that way? Can fish see? Can they really see? They obviously have eyes, but can they really see? Can they understand what they're seeing? You make that same argument. Where do we see? Where do we process our vision? We process it in the occipital lobe of the brain, the back part here of the, you know, the, the neocortex back there, uh, the neocortex of the occipital lobe. Fish do not process vision there. They have something in the lower brain, the optic tectum. That's where they do the, the visual processing. They don't process up in the cerebrum. So by that argument, fish can't really perceive what they're seeing. And that sounds really crazy if you look at what fish or environment they're living in. These, all these colors, all these fish that clearly are using color and, uh, on mate selection, on food selection, on where they're moving to. You know, they, they've got to be able to perceive that. It's not like they're going around with blinders on. So anyway, so that's why I, I kind of rejected that argument. It really is ignoring the fact that brains are very plastic and what it's, it's an, what, un, unlike anthropomorphic where you're making things like animals, that's an anthropocentric view. It's saying, it's putting everything in the view of if they were animals, if, the, if they were like people, this is what it is, it's putting people at the top. And clearly fish brains are not people brains. They're quite different. <laughs> And they, they function differently, and they think in different parts of it. So what arguments are there that fish do feel pain? Well, first of all, as I mentioned already, they have pain-sensing neurons. They have things where you can stimulate with heat or with pressure or whatever, and they fire and they send you know, signals up into the fish brain. If you inject a fish with bee venom, it behaves just like you might expect something that's in pain. They they, they sink down to the bottom, they rub their, if they eject their jaw, they'll rub their jaw against the bottom, they'll stop eating for a long period, it's like they've been shocked by this thing. Um, and then think about fish that are caught on a hook. If you measure fish that have been captured, they very quickly release loads of endorphins into their brain. What are endorphins? They're the natural painkiller, the same thing that we have when we get injured. We release these endorphins. So the, like marathon runners release lots of endorphins as they run because it's killing the pain so they can continue doing this running even though they otherwise would be in a lot of pain from doing that. Well, why would you have these 
uh, these hormones that reduce pain if you don't feel pain. Does that make any sense? But then you go down to the logic of it. Pain is adaptive. Pain helps you because it teaches you what you should avoid. You, you touch something, it hurts. You now, if, if you know it hurts, you're going to avoid that because you learn to avoid those things that cause you pain. If you can't feel pain, what's the use? People who were born, there are people who have been born without pain sensing neurons. And you find that they damage themselves very quickly. They don't learn to, even though they might intellectually know they're going to hurt themselves in this way, they really don't learn that they hurt themselves and they end up, you know, they die at young ages because they just kill themselves basically. So fish we know can learn. You can teach fish things. But if they can't feel pain, they can't learn to avoid the things that damage them. If you're thinking of animals, you know, we think of them through our senses, but in fact you'll find that animals have, in some cases, more or better senses than we do. Here's some examples. Drug or cancer sniffing dogs. Cancer sniffing, what that's about. They have found dogs that you can take the breath of somebody who has lung cancer and you know, have them breathe into a bag and put it over here, or to have the breath of someone who hasn't. The dog can distinguish between the two. And they can uh, detect cancer at times when the, the doctors can't yet. So amazing. Uh, I was talking with a gentleman here earlier about uh, echolocation in bats. First of all, you don't even hear, when you're out there, you don't even hear the noise the bat's making because it's way above our hearing range. But they're really loud. They're making this really loud noise. But more amazing to me is try yourself to echolocate. Put your finger out there, shout at it, and see if you can figure out where the echo's coming back from. No way. There's no way we can do that. They can. They can, dec they can locate a moth out there very accurately and home in on it based on this echolocation. Electrical sensing, what is this? What does a, a fish have this ability, some fish, not all, some fish have the ability to produce an electric field out there and then detect things moving based on stuff bouncing out. What does that look like? I'm using look in a certain sense to a fish. We have no idea. We can't detect that stuff. Um, lateral lines in fish, they, fish have very poor hearing, but they have these lateral lines which are used to detect motion and movement of, in water. And then here's another one. Magnetic sensing. Birds are known to have sensors in their eyes and probably in their bills also that can detect the Earth's magnetic field or can detect other magnetic fields. It's thought that this is just really important for birds doing migration. And what does that look like to them? What are they sensing? We just don't know. So that's why I call these superhuman senses because they're senses that we just don't have. Homing ability, you know, you plop one of us out 300 miles, unless we have a GPS unit, you know, you know or somebody to ask, we probably couldn't find ourselves our way back. But um, in Australia, they were, you know, trying to clear crocodiles out of this one area, so they take them, and like people commonly do, they think, well, if we just move it away, it's going to, you know, we won't have to worry about them here. But they put uh, some transmitters on them and found that these crocodiles take them 250 miles away. Three weeks later, they're back again. They're traveling over 10 miles a day to get back. They found their way all this way. How did they do that? They never were over there before. How did they know to come back and get to the exact same river where they were? Just amazing. And then wildebeest being able to detect rainfall 30 miles away, so they don't have to wait, sit there waiting for the, when the rain's going to come to the area. If it's rained over there, they're going to go over there and get the nice green vegetation from where that, that happened. You know, we have no idea how they, they do this. Let's get back to that question of consciousness. What is consciousness? And this is, I, I, I've got to admit, by the way, that in a sense, this is not my field. I don't have, I've not really been involved in reading all the different philosophies of consciousness. This is sort of a, just my own putting stuff together, but I think a lot of us have these thoughts. I think that consciousness is really related to the ability to focus on what's important. You're conscious of things, you're focusing on these certain things and to ignore or pay little attention to these, all these inputs that are not important. Because we all have so many senses, so much broad vision, seeing all the stuff out here, hearing, smelling, taste, and then you look at these other animals with all these other senses. You just can't process all that stuff fully at the same time. You've got to be able to concentrate on what's important. And think of an example, by the way, of uh, how many of you have ever been in a car driving somewhere and you leave here, and all of a sudden you arrive there, and you realize you really don't remember getting from point A to point B. Well, actually, you probably were conscious through all that time. You were processing stuff. 
but you're processing in a way that your body just said, you know, this is really boring stuff. We don't have to remember it. We're just going to pass it off, and we're not going to store our memory of that. Um, because while you're doing that, the reason why it was un you're unconscious to your driving is because you're thinking of other things, whatever it is. You know, whatever, you're thinking of where you're going, what you're going to do there, uh, some argument you have with somebody. You're thinking of that sort of stuff. That's what's important to you. You're concentrating on that. That is what you're conscious of rather than the driving. And so you just sort of forget about the driving. You still make it there just fine because you actually are conscious of the driving while you're doing it. So, the, the idea is that you can only focus on certain inputs, but you can change your focus. And I really think that's what consciousness is about. And well, what does that say about fish then? Well, fish has as many sensory inputs as we do, except for they can't smell very well. That's one thing they, they don't have. But they have taste, which is basically the same thing as smell, extremely good uh, sense of taste, being able to detect chemicals in the water. But they have well-developed vision, as we've seen. Uh, they have poor hearing, but they have these lateral lines to detect movements. Um, they have, many of them have this ability to detect weak electric fields. So they have all these different s sources of inputs to them, but their brains are tiny, as we saw. They can't concentrate on everything with that tiny brain. So they need to focus on what's important to them. If there's a predator nearby, they better be focused on that predator, not on eating or not on mating or something like that. Whereas if there's no predator nearby, but there's a potential mate, or the, you know, something's, their eggs are about to be laid, and this male's got to concentrate on getting over there and fertilizing those eggs right away. So they've got to be able to, to concentrate and move their focus to what's important at the time. And you know, from that standpoint, that seems a pretty strong argument that fish should be conscious just like we are, because they have the same needs that we do. So let's ask that question of brain structure here. Fish brains can very clearly do the same sort of thing. They can take all these different sensory inputs and coordinate them into a directed motor output, be it chasing after food, avoiding a predator, uh, going after mates, fertilizing eggs, what, uh, you know, avoiding harmful stimuli. They can do all this. Um, they do this with, you saw how tiny that cerebrum was. They don't have a well-developed neocortex. To assume that a neocortex in the big cerebrum is required for consciousness is to take an extremely anthropocentric view of fish. Um, so if you look at it, now you've got to remember fish really do have very small brains, so you can't expect a lot of learning or a lot of complicated behavior. But vertebrates you know, evolving from fish the brain evolved, and diff eventually the cerebrum did get big and sort of took over. But my guess is that many of the functions that our cerebrum does now were done by the lower brain in these things, and it was the same thing as consciousness. And there are actually a lot of experiments showing that we still have vestigial aspects of our brains that can function. There's something called blind sight. Pe certain people who had damage to the occipital lobe of their brain, they can't see things. And yet, if you ask them, you know, you hold up a big red thing and sort of flash it by them, ask them what was there. They said, I can't see that, but I think it was, but my body's telling me it was red. Somehow they, they, they have this processing in the lower brain that is somehow getting to them so that they, but they can't actually see it because that part of their brain is damaged. So, well, when you're talking about brains though, you know, again, we often think of ourselves as the top because we have the big brains. Well, actually, there are many cases where big brains can be a detriment. And the main thing is that the brains take up a lot of energy. And animals, energy is important. The human brain is just about 2% of our weight. And you know, it's just a little mass of stuff inside the skull there. And yet it receives 15% of the cardiac output, the blood of our body. 15% of the blood goes to the brain. 20% of the oxygen used is used by the brain. 25% of the glucose used is used by the brain. That's huge met met uh, metabolic needs. So if you don't need a big brain, if you can cut that down as, say, a small bird, you know, they couldn't you waste all this energy that way. It's also they couldn't fly with a huge brain because it'd be too heavy. Here's a little example I'll show you later, but chickadees. You know, anybody know how heavy a chickadee is? Everybody knows what chickadees are. You could put two chickadees in an envelope and mail it first class because they're less than an ounce. Uh, each chickadee is, is, is about uh, 10 grams or about a third of an ounce. That's how small they are. So they can't carry a big, heavy brain around. They just wouldn't be able to fly with that. Some of the amazing things birds can do is memory. And this, this Animal Minds here has a great series. I won't show the whole thing. I won't show it here at the moment. About Clark's Nutcracker, which is the bird on top there. 
it's a relation to the J. It's basically a J-sized bird. Little tiny brain, right? I'm just a little bird. Birds look a lot bigger than they are because they're all fluffy. But if you look at the size of, you know, what you peck the feathers off, those things are really small. Um, you know, a little bit bigger than a robin in this case. They can bury, they can, uh, in August, when the, uh, the pinion pines produce their nuts, they massive crops of nuts. This is what those Clark's nutcrackers live on all winter. So what they do is they go out and harvest these nuts and jam them into the soil in different places. And they'll do this spread out over like a 12 mile area. So it's very broad. 30,000 pine nuts in just three weeks. They're bearing like about 100 an hour. Just amazing you know, how fast they're, they're, that's all they do for this period. Just harvest nuts, bury, harvest nuts, bury. And then over the course of the next six months, they'll, t they'll pull those up and they'll eat them. Even though it's snowed and the whole place is snow covered, they still know where those nuts are buried and they'll locate as many as 90% of them. They'll dig down through the snow and find them. 30,000 nuts. They're remembering where these things are months later in that tiny brain. Just amazing. Even chickadees, which are so much smaller that, again, you could put two in an envelope and mail them off first class if you were cruel. <laughs> um, they, uh, they store seeds too and they can remember where they are for long periods. So just amazing. Um, they also some evidence that they brains get a little bit bigger in the fall as they're remembering where they store things and then in the spring they kind of shrink back down again as they sort of forget all the places where they've harvested the, the seeds from and they don't need to worry about that anymore. Which again points to that whole thing about brains are metabol metabolically expensive. You want to have as a small a brain as you can get away with from, in a certain sense uh, in order to survive out there. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about instinct and learning because again, going back to Rene Descartes, um, he believed that animals were ruled by inflexible instinct. They didn't reason, that they just had these sort of behaviors built into them. And um, what is instinct? Instinct is behavior that is not learned. It's stuff that you were born with, you're inherited. And when you think about it, virtually all the behaviors of say newborns have got to be instinctual because how could they have learned them? Even though there are some things, you know, kind of a funny thing, uh, uh, nursing, for instance, you'll see babies in utero will be sucking on their thumbs. So essentially they're sort of practicing that, but nobody taught them how to do that. They're, so they're kind of, it's, it's an instinctual thing to do that, that they're uh, learning from instinct. One thing that I think we found, and I'll try to argue, is that there are many things that are sort of semi-instinctual, that there's an instinctual background to it, but then, learning or reasoning or whatever has taken that far beyond. But, um, and many key human behaviors are instinctual. Although you'll find that people disagree with that statement, uh, if you go on Wikipedia at least a couple days ago and look, you'll see this one whole paragraph which makes the claim that the humans have absolutely no instincts at all, that, they, uh, that everything is learned. And I think that might be because Wikipedia, anybody can get in there and edit stuff. Uh, but, uh, Certainly some people feel that and they, they came up with that conclusion by sort of defining instinct as being something where you can't change it at all by learning and reasoning. Well, if that's true, that's also true of animals. That they, animals probably don't have very little instincts then either. Okay, how many people know what this is and know what it's doing? If you saw our website, I had what it is. Yes? It, it is a kill there. Yeah. This is the killer doing the broken wing display. And when do they do these? Do they do it? This is where I'm getting to the question of where you can actually use science to figure these things out. You don't have to just say, oh, there's no way we can prove this. You can make hypotheses of this. Here's a hypothesis. If this really is the bird trying to lead you away from chicks and nests, it should only do this behavior when there are chicks or nests with eggs around. It shouldn't do the behavior, say, in the fall, after, or, or if the nest has been predated and all the chicks are dead, uh, it shouldn't do this behavior anymore. And you'll find that's a, you test that out, you find it's true. They do this when they have chicks around, they don't do it otherwise. What do they do here? And, and this is what Carol Rostow, uh, Rostow, Carolyn Rostow did on plovers in general. Um, Kilder's a big plover, she did it more on piping plovers and Wilson plovers. But they all do the similar sorts of broken wing display and what they do is when, when a predator or something that looks like it could be a predator, say a human, approaches their nest, they have three different things they could do. They, they just nest on, just like this looks here, see how that gravel there? It, they just put eggs right out there. The eggs are very well camouflaged because they look like pebbles essentially. 
but you know, they, they don't uh, hide the eggs per se. They just make use of the fact that they're just out there in the middle of nowhere that nobody would look for them. Um, but as, if something approaches them, might be searching for eggs, what they might do is they might just stealthily leave, get off the nest, get away, so that they don't, the, the, whatever is approaching, it doesn't detect the bird. It's less likely to detect the eggs than it is to detect the bird on the nest. So they might do that. Or they might go up there and start doing alarm. If they had chicks, for instance, there, they might just start doing alarm calls to tell the chicks what's going on. Or they might do this broken wing display. And she found that only about 40% of the time they did the broken wing display. But then you start asking questions, well, you know, is that anthropomorphic to think that what they're trying to do is lead you away from the nest? Isn't that we're putting a sense of reason to them? Well, that's something you can test. Are they really trying to lead you away from the nest or not? Well, go out there and test to see, uh, walk up to a nest and see what happens, what the bird does. And what you'll find is the bird will often walk or come closer to the predator, not trying to escape, they come closer and get in front of it. To, and then start doing the broken wing display away from the chicks. Not necessarily straight away, off to the side often, but never, almost never towards the chicks. Always off to the side or, or away from the chicks. Well, that seems to be pretty, you know, that, that's some interesting evidence. If, if the predator isn't following them, you'll see them looking back to watch what the predator's doing. And if it's not following them, they might turn around and come back and get right back in front of the predator again and try and do it again. That doesn't sound like a bird trying to avoid, you know, that it sounds like it's really trying to lead things away. Or it might just start displaying really heavily. It might start sort of flapping its wings really around, really making a lot of display. Well, one other thing they did was um, to test what these birds are doing is they did an experiment where they had two people, and they dressed these people very different clothing. And they'd first have them both come up to the nest and go nearby so they see if there's any real difference how the birds reacted to the people just that way. But the bird people didn't really threaten the nest at all. Then they did it again, and this time they had the two people randomly chosen, which one would which. They did this on many different birds, and they only did one test per bird. But they'd have one person walk, you know, there's a nest over there. They'd walk by maybe about 12, 15 feet away, and they wouldn't look at the nest. They'd just walk by. But the other person would then come up and they come over here, and then they'd stop, and they'd be looking at the nest the whole time they were there. And then they come over closer to maybe about six feet away, and they'd sort of get down and start looking down in the grass nearby. And then they would walk off. And then, you know, then they went away for you know, a period of time. Then after that, they would randomly take those two people again, and randomly decide either the first or the second, and have that person come walk by the nest again. And what you found is that 25 out of 31 times, the person who stopped and looked at the egg, regardless of whether they were wearing the red jacket or the blue jacket, you know, whatever it was that it was, randomly, that 25 out of 31 times, the person who was the threatening one, the bird, well, they wouldn't do the broken wing display, they would do the get off the nest and leave, as though being very stealthy. So this means that these birds are perceiving differences in these predators, so-called predators, different humans, based on their experience with them. Look at how big this bird, the piping plover is a little bit bigger than a chickadee. So Peter, what did they do with the other one? They never reacted to the... They, 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 there were three of the cases, they, they, uh, it was the, the person who was not the threatening one which they walked out of, and three cases there was no difference in the reaction. So out of the 25, and that's a highly significant statistical difference, 25 times one way, only three times the other way, and three were neutral. So. Um, so that's just a, you know, amazing sort of, you know, conscious, well, this little tiny bird is very clearly able to do a whole lot that nobody would have thought to do if they weren't doing these sorts of, would thought they're possible to do if they weren't doing these sorts of experiments on them. Each one of these was done in, the, in a single day. Here's another example, and I've called them as rodents, but what type of rodent are we talking about here? Beavers. A nice big rodent. You know, is dam building learned or instinctual? A lot of people just say it's instinctual, and I think that really, there, it's, this is where you really get that blending. Because look at what, what beavers do. They'll often gather materials together and shape them before they start building the dam or the lodge. Um, if you take this dam and you put a big drain pipe through it, the reaction of the beaver first was to get up there and wh where the pipe went through, they would start trying to put mud there, which of course was completely ineffectual. But then they would turn around and they'd go to the, to the top end of the drain pipe and they'd plug it. So they figured out how to behave there. Um, 
if you put a cap over this, this pipe, which has little tiny holes in it, they would actually fashion little pegs and put the pegs in the holes. And they do things like digging canals so that if the log falls in the water, you know, near the water, they could float this log out to put it into the thing instead of using brute force. Another thing that they do is adjust water levels. When the pond freezes over in the winter, they'll go out there and they'll take part of their dam down a little bit, allowing the water level to lower, which all of a sudden puts an airspace between the ice and the water, allowing them to swim around safely in that period, uh, you know, out, out of sight of potential predators and so on. So, you know, are these things instinctual? That's well, kind of hard to say whether they are or not, that there's certainly a whole lot of um, behavior that's not pure instinct going into this. There are a lot of things where they're figuring things out that what experience do, do beavers have with artificial pipes? You know, it's not something that they would have an instinct for. It's got to be something that's, that's out there otherwise. Well, some people might find this a bit controversial, but I, I think it's absolutely clear that when we think of our behaviors, a lot of what we do is instinctual the same way it is with animals, but we don't think of it as instinctual because it's so natural to us. Great example would be baby, newborn babies, not newborn, but you know, when they're toddlers, two years old, and you give them a new food. If that food is, say, a bitter food, they'll, you put it in their mouth, they'll like, try to take that, Egh! And, or you give them a sweet food, and all of a sudden they're just really happy. Well, nobody taught them that this is bitter or this is sweet. That was a natural thing. In a sense, it's like an instinct, but it's something they, they somehow know that things with certain types of chemical formulas in them, are bit, you know, which cause the bitterness taste, causes them to reject that. So here's some examples of, you know, first are simple reflex uh, instincts. Like, you know, you come up to someone, put, go like this right to in front of their nose. They're going to flinch. They're going to close their blink. They're, you know, all these things. They aren't thinking about that. That's entirely instinctual, entirely reflexive that they do that. Baby nursing, I already mentioned, clearly that's got to be a, a whole lot of instinct in that, you know, that the baby knows to grab onto a nipple and start sucking. Um, you know, you didn't have to teach the baby how to do that. Baby's attractions to faces, all this experiments where you, you know, you put a different object over the baby and if it's a face, they're going to behave differently from if it's not a face. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'll throw in one for my wife's family's benefit there, fear of snakes. That, you know, I think a lot of people feel that sort of, an, it just, I've never had a fear of snake, but even my brother, who actually likes studying reptiles, still had this thing about snakes that he has a little bit of hesitancy there. So, and then this is one that I think is just really important. It's, it's, it's important, but it's very clearly not just straight instinct, but it's very much in, inborn in us. And that is our, our wanting to do things where we help out our group. And that group might be a family or it might be another group. And the Army, I think, has really learned about this one in terms of putting unrelated people together who have nothing in common and coming up with ways to make them bond together so they function as a group, and such that they are willing to help out each other even to the point of risking their own lives. I think that a whole lot of that sort of natural, you know, being attracted to people you're working with, it's got to be instinctual. But just because it's instinctual, does not make it any less important, doesn't make it so we don't experience it less. It's we experience these instincts fully. They are part of you know, what tastes good, what we like to do. It, it's, that's so important to us. It doesn't matter that it's instinctual or not, it still is darn important to us. And if I can go into one here as an example of going to an instinctual thing, going down to the biochemistry of it, or a related biochemistry, because it's clearly not only that. Um, I'll give some examples with animals first. There's a, a hormone produced in the brains of both males and females called oxytocin. It's a very small polypeptide, six amino acids in it. And it's used for a whole lot of things that in humans and in animals relating to um, uh, things like um, mother-child bonding, bonding of males to females. Uh, you know, when, when birth occurs, there's uh, oxytocins involved in sort of bring the uterus back into um, you know, condition after it's done all this massive pushing the baby out and so on. I, I'm not a, an endocrinologist. I don't know a whole lot about it, but you can look up and stuff, and there's stuff in, in this about it too. Um, if you get, take a rat, a mother rat that's just giving birth, and you inject it with what's called an oxytocin antagonist, this is something that blocks oxytocin, that mother rat will not behave normally, will not 
do normal maternal behavior towards its babies. On the other hand, if you take such sheep that have not had any babies, a, a female sheep, and you inject it with oxytocin, that sheep all of a sudden starts showing maternal behavior towards lambs that are not its own lambs. If there's a lamb nearby and you inject it with oxytocin, it will start showing maternal behavior towards that lamb. It's strongly involved in, in, in mother-baby bonding in all animals, including, including humans, and many other aspects of human behavior. But again, the point is that you know, even though oxytocin might cause this, you, know, you get a, a real big rush of it right after giving birth, and that is thought to be one of the things that really bonds mothers so intensely to their children if they get this ability to hold their child while they're having this oxytocin rush. Even though that's, you know, th there's this chemical reason for it, it doesn't make it any less unreal. It is so important of an emotion. And it's very clear that it's that way in humans, and as this thing really points out, it's that way in naked mole rats too, and in elephants. They give examples of this. It's just amazing about how these, um, these animals work. But I did want to talk a little bit about language because this is something which I think people are, a lot of people downgrade animals saying, how could they think? They don't have language. We think in language they couldn't possibly be like us. And do animals have language? And let's start out with parrots because everybody knows that parrots, parrot means to imitate something back, right? And non means the bird, but it means to imitate. Birds don't know what they're saying when they're imitating things. Right? Generally, that's probably true. Although sometimes, they, you know, maybe some alarm calls or things like that they do. But in the case of parrots you know, saying, Polly want a cracker, does, does Polly know anything about what that really means? Well, Alex, who unfortunately died a couple years ago, um, there's a great article about that in the March 2008 National Geographic. Alex was taught the, the meaning of the words that he was taught. And he could use them what I think is a serious issue of confusing consciousness with intelligence. And I think, I'm, I don't know, I'm going to be in the majority of the way a lot of people are thinking on this uh, in the scientific community now, but what we see commonly happen is as we find animals are more intelligent, like Ian McPhail did, all of a sudden he starts throwing these other things up. Well, counting isn't enough, you need arithmetic. And you, you keep on adding these things. And the question is, when are you talking about things being conscious versus when you're talking about intelligence? One of the, here's things where, where people talk about different levels of, of consciousness. You know, I had the level of just being awake and aware, but other people talk about, well, being aware of what others are thinking, which by the way, a lot of animals very clearly are, and there's great stuff in this about animals being able to figure out what others are thinking. Being aware of self and being aware of your mortality, the fact you're going to die. They say these are different levels of consciousness. To me, no, these are different levels of intelligence. A common thing is to say that an animal can show that it's self-aware because it can recognize itself in a mirror. Well, you take an animal out there in the wild, what experience do they have with mirrors? Why would the fact that there's this image in a mirror make them think that that's them, as opposed to, they know it's not them, they know what they are. I'm over here, I'm not over there, that can't be me. So, the fact that you're more intel that we have the intelligence to figure out that's an image of me is not a sign of consciousness to me. It's a sign of intelligence. It's a sign of being able to figure out that you, you do things and you see this other one do that and you realize that they're so tied together that this must be an image of you. And the, what comes down to the question is, if we are going to take these views of being conscious as things like being able to recognize yourself in a mirror, that gives you the uncomfortable conclusion that a child who's two years old is not conscious because they can't do it. They can't recognize themselves in a mirror. A common thing for recognizing yourself in a mirror is to put it's like a dot on the, the, the person or the animal where they can't see it so they have something on them. And then you give them a mirror and if they look at the mirror and say, oh, there's something there and they go up and reach for it, that's certainly an indication that they know what's there. A two-year-old child will not do that. And like a three or four year old child probably doesn't have a, you know, awareness of mortality in the sense that we do it. You know, their little fish dies and they don't grieve the fish necessarily, but they, you know, they, they oh, it died, let's go get another one, uh, you know, sort of thing. A lot of parents are kind of upset when their children behave that way because it seems like it's, you know, that the children don't have the empathy there, but it's basically because they're only three or four years old yet. They haven't uh, developed that far. 
So are, are you going to say that a two-year-old is not conscious when you see them building with blocks or something like that and just doing amazing sorts of things? You know, I can't buy that myself. So I wanted to just uh, close a little bit with, I talked about pain to begin with, but I wanted to talk about pleasure. Uh, because just like pain is adaptive because it teaches you what to avoid, pleasure is also extremely adaptive because it teaches you what is good. And we, this is one of the points that Jonathan Balcom makes very strongly in this book, which is, by the way, an excellent book, and I hope that some of you will buy it when it comes out or get it out of the library. It'll be out again at, coming in March. But his point is that a lot of scientists have tend to, and the, a lot of the nature shows we've seen have tend to emphasize the, how cruel nature is, that you're always out there, the hunter and the hunted and so on. And he points out that it is probably not that way, that anim, for animals, good feelings are also important and they do a whole lot of things that make them feel good.